Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining our session. This is Hera from Chen and we have Allison here as well. So Allison, how are you doing today? We had a busy day today, didn't we? We did, although I, I feel like every day ends up being busy kind of in a good way because you're in the routine. Um, but no, I'm doing well. It's been kind of rainy, but other than that, I think I'm coping. It's really sunny where I am, which oh, no. is a pleasant surprise, but it's also bad because I have just started biking and I fell from my bike yesterday, oh, raped my knee, damaged the chains, and <laughs> it's the perfect biking weather and I can't go out. So I'll be going for a walk. Um, my husband thinks I'm being a baby uh, because <laughs> I got a very little scratch, but I've been, I looked at it with such forlorn eyes that my... <laughs> My husband's been calling me a baby. Um, so I gracefully <laughs> accepted it and got him to buy me some pizza yesterday. And um, there might be a burger in it for me tonight as well. You, you got him to buy you pizza? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because because of the fact that I broke my own bike and you know scraped my own knee. It was also at the speed of 1.01 miles per hour because I was turning very slowly and i thought you know oh there's no way i will have any trouble with this turn then push oh, yeah. I'd, I'd like to think that we're starting this webinar trying to like establish a sense of respect as speakers mm -hmm. and <laughs> <laughs> yes everyone knows uh what a bumblebee i am now so mm -hmm. uh welcome you know thank you so much for joining the webinar it's our first uh, webinar as part of bloom some of you may know um Jen and may find this, you know, uh, familiar faces. Um, may have seen this on Instagram or Twitter. Uh, we're very happy to have you. Please drop a like a one-line description of who you are. If you want to say it, you want to share your name, or you can make one up. You know, brownie points for creativity. Um, so and tell us like which part of the world you're tuning in from. Again, it could be somewhere where you are or somewhere you'd rather be. So um, lots of options. <laughs> And we actually have two people from our team who are also in here uh, in the call, but um, you won't see their videos. It's um, Becky and Tiffany, and they're both part of the Bloom team. And we'll tell you a bit more about Chen and Bloom in a second. Becky is in the chat, and so is Tiffany, so you can see them messaging. Um, I'll kick off with an introduction to Chen, and then also maybe you can tell people about Bloom. So. Yeah. Um, Chen is a nonprofit. We've been going for seven years um, and we run by volunteers and uh, it's all about empowering people, uh, especially people who are experiencing gender based violence um, and creating resources that speak to, you know, the survivor's experience that really centers that at the heart of everything and having a trauma informed approach. So, um, and Bloom is one of our new projects, which we started actually during lockdown. So um, Tiffany, sorry, not Tiffany, Allison, do you want to tell us about it? Yeah, so initially um, when lockdowns first started in the UK in March, we adapted a therapy group um, to an online program where we could deliver um, information to survivors and support them uh, rather than doing that in person, which wasn't available anymore. So we ran a 10 week course that was all about trauma resilience, where we gave out information and checked in through daily videos and messages. Um, and we covered a wide variety of topics that were all about building up resilience and trying to empower our community. Um, we ended up getting funding at the end of those 10 weeks to then develop five other courses where we could basically be more specific to address the needs of our community, whether that was to help uh, sexual abuse survivors or domestic abuse survivors or running a course on managing anxiety. Um, so we've been putting those together and this webinar is meant as a taster session of one of the uh, videos that we were giving out to the group. Um, so yeah, and we have five courses launching. So our website will be coming up next week, which means you can sign up and for any of those courses, do them from the comfort of your home. Um, yep. They are anonymous, so in the sense that no, you will be in a group, but you won't be able to see each other. So that mm -hmm. means your identity can be protected um, if you are in a situation where you're not comfortable, other people knowing that you're um, attending that long like course. Some courses are going to be eight weeks, some are going to be four weeks or six weeks. Uh, but you'll find all about that next week. And yeah. I love that we are seeing people from <laughs> different parts of the world where they are or they'd rather be. 
um, mm -hmm. and that's really nice. So um, we we're going to start off with telling you the goal. So this is how a typical video starts. Um, in fact, I'll tell you a bit about how the course actually runs. So mm -hmm. um, let's take the example of an eight week course. Every Tuesday and Thursday, you would get a video, which would be 20 to 30 minutes long, usually 20 minutes. And in that, we would uh, talk about a particular subject. So let's say if it's talk talking about anxiety, we would talk about what anxiety is, something like what we're doing today, and different ways of both uh, understanding the effects of anxiety and then ways of managing it. So at the end of each video, you would get homework. You would get that link sent to the video uh, in either Telegram or WhatsApp. And uh, you would see the video and afterwards you would have a special link which will allow you to chat to us one-on-one -on -one and send your homework in. So then by the time of Thursday, you would have sent your homework in would have had a chat with us about it. And then on Thursday, when we do our next video, we would incorporate what you've told us into the video. So that way that, you know, people who are in that group, you can't see each other, uh, but you know that there are other people in the same situation as you and you'll get to hear their thoughts and their examples. Yeah. So this video that we're going to do for you today is going to be slightly longer because we wanted to cover more sub uh, more ground than we would usually do is consider this the equ equivalent of two videos yeah, yeah, two week, it's like two it's two sessions in one week so it would be an example yeah. of one week of content spaced out covering kind of two subjects so anxiety as well as negative thoughts in this case yes yeah, so let's kick off with our goals like we usually do so what are the goals for this particular session Alison? so we want our viewers to learn the difference between stress and anxiety we're also going to explore grounding techniques to cope with physical and emotional reactions to that anxiety. And we're also gonna learn how to switch off our sympathetic nervous system, which is a term we'll explain later on. Uh, we are also going to introduce the concept of automatic negative thoughts or ants, as our group has started to call them. Becky coined that term. Uh, and then we are going to discuss the benefits of thought diaries and give out some self-care homework. So it's kind of really like coming along for the whole ride of the session. Um, the other thing that we like to do in Bloom in our videos is to begin each session with a small grounding exercise, and it's meant to help us connect with the present and focus and kind of settle in with our bodies and relax. So you're welcome to join in, um, but don't feel like you have to strain yourselves to match us. We in Bloom do a different grounding exercise at the start of each video because it's about your comfort and finding one that works for you. So today, our gun exercise is going to be visualizing your favorite place. So Hera asked at the start where you're from or where you might want to be, but we want to know your favorite place and have you think of it, whether that's at home or the home of a loved one or a foreign country, and try to use every one of your five senses to create that mental image. So think of the colors that you might see or the sounds or the sensations you feel on your skin. So Hera, would you like to share what your favorite place is? Yes, I'll share the, my favorite place right now because I think the favorite place can change. So let's mm -hmm. look at what I do now. Um, yeah. I live by the quay. So there's a lot of water around me and there's a particular mm -hmm. part of the quay where um, it's, it's really quiet and there are some ducks and pigeons that like circling there. And okay. there's a bench, which is made of wood, like brown wood. And I like sitting there and just putting my hands on the bridge or just standing there and like looking out to the water with like the quacks and the chirping of the birds and ducks. Mm -hmm. And there's there's a whole row of trees behind me. So that means I can hear the rustling of uh, the leaves because of the wind, which is like my favorite thing is... Um, when the British weather works, I didn't grow up here, uh, mm -hmm. but when the, my favorite part of British weather is only for a few months, which is when it's, it's the sun's out, but there's wind and it's cool yeah. wind, you know, it's like a breeze. So that would be my, my, that's my favorite place right now. I, I like that you modified it to say right now. And I'd love if people want to share in the chat as well. We'd love to read those. Um, cause I was about to talk about the sea too, when you talked about the key and where I grew up, um, cause I'm from the West coast in Canada. But I've really, really cherished lately, especially with lockdown, um, getting up quite early and going on um, walks along the river. And you have those same bird sounds and the chirps. 
especially earlier in the summer where all the birds are like a little bit too excited. But it's really, really lovely just getting to hear that kind of cool dark water. And um, I leave them going walking early enough that sometimes they're not even awake. Awake, So you'll get the swans and the cygnets, their little babies kind of just like nestled along the side and they're not actually a threat to you at that hour. Um, and I even found a little fox cub on one of the morning walks that I did. So I think right now, maybe that would be my favorite place to be. Oh, and we have Becky shared in the chat. Best friends living room well <laughs> while they're cats around. You know, you know me, I have two cats, so I, I love that. And we have a walk around Dad's village in India. That sounds great. Oh, so nice. um, and so we, uh, as you're thinking about this and keep, keep talking to us, uh, we love it. We have another thing for you. So because we think that oftentimes like, you know, therapeutic content can be quite heavy because it's very introspective. Mm -hmm. We'd like to inject some fun. Um, and sometimes that fun can be very much, you know, if you coin the internet culture, internet culture dad jokes type of vibe. But yeah, we'll we'll go with we'll go to a fun question after our ground exercise. So our fun question is, um, what is the story behind your name? So um, I know that a lot of people have no idea what their name means, so that's okay if you don't know. But I'm obsessed with like names and like what they mean. So it's I can, like etymology, I think. Yes, exactly. And like, the, you know, why, um, what, what, what made that name come about, especially where I am from, I'm from Pakistan, and like in the East, like names are very significant, they're chosen for a particular reason, not just because of how they sound. So um, there's a reason why people ch chase, you know, cho choose them. So for my name, my name is, is, uh, is a holy cave. And uh, the reason why my parents chose that name was because I was born in the UK, even though I didn't grow up there. They wanted a name that was short and people could say it correctly, but also um, there was like a anglicized version of it um, because Hera, of course, is a Greek goddess. So yeah. an anglicized version is not the correct <laughs> terminology for it. <laughs> so yeah, that's how my name is. Um, and we have someone else. So Fletcher means arrow maker by all accounts <laughs> great i will say uh when i was younger i my first name means uh little truth which i kind of liked and then i went wait why is the modifier little little but uh when i was looking up the meaning of my last name i was told it meant cabinet maker so <laughs> I I have you ever made one no i feel like that is live up to your name. lost to time <laughs> I tell you, this is, this has to go on your bucket list. It's like, live, you know, this is, gives a whole new meaning to living up to your name. So uh, let's move on to, um, you know, why are we here? We're here to talk about fear and anxiety. And I think it's something that a lot of us will experience, have experienced in their life. Both fear and anxiety are super common. There are type of emotions, whether we've been through something violent or abusive, um, but also it's kind of part and parcel from living um, our daily lives, especially if they're stressful and they're in the environment that we're living in right now with lockdowns and disease around us, you know, it's completely understandable why we may be feeling like that. Um, but there is a difference between uh, fear and anxiety and they're not synonyms. And we wanted to clarify that um, in this webinar. So, um, you know, Alison has, why don't you tell us what fear is? Yeah. So, what we do in Bloom is obviously we put together research and we make it accessible. And when we were first looking into fear, I was really surprised to learn that biologically, it's meant to be a useful emotion. Uh, it's actually a primary feeling that activates our response system and it's meant to be protective. So fear as an emotion mobilizes us into action. So if you can imagine a car is coming towards you in the road, you don't stop and think or weigh the pros and cons about whether or not it would be bad if a car were to hit you. You react to that by leaping out of the way. So fear in that way occurs in the presence of an immediate danger or threat, and it's designed to keep you safe when you respond to it. And you might have heard before about the three F fear responses. So when we're in danger, we tend to either fight, flee, or freeze. So let's say in front of the car, you flee, you jump out of the way. 
in if you were in the woods and there was a wild creature you might freeze because you don't want to make any noise or if you get in a situation of combat maybe you need to fight back so you may have also noticed that you tend towards one of these three f responses more than the other and our brains actually learn which one of those three keeps you the safest and then tends to repeat it um so it may seem counterintuitive but again fear not anxiety is meant to work in our favor because our pro bodies are programmed to keep us alive and well, unlike anxiety. Uh, so Hera, do you want to define anxiety for us? Yes, so in contrast to fear, anxiety um, is always caused by uncertainty or, or, you know, or not knowing, so the unknown. So anxiety happens not just in the presence of like immediate danger, it, but also when we, um, it happens when we can't predict the, uh, the future and we try to do that so that we're trying to being af afraid of something or trying to prevent something or change the outcome and we can't. Um, and this can be exhausting for anyone um, as we, you know, in our head cycle through like all the different scenarios, all the possible ways that something could go wrong um, and trying to like prepare for it in advance and um, thinking of how we can stop them. And often this happens because we don't trust ourselves um, to react to events um, um, in the present, unless like we've like completely prepared for it, we've rehearsed for it, uh, which is a legitimate feeling uh, when you know we've made mistakes in the past or we've had bad experiences um, and we've been taught to doubt ourselves, um, and, and which especially happens to people who are marginalized in society, you know, because of you know, the, which group they belong to, um, or if we've been exhausted into a compliant state and had others doubt us um, or repeatedly hurt us. So um, it's interesting to look at like etymology, we were talking about that. Uh, in the English language, the word anxiety, um, like worry, stems from a root that means to choke. Um, and that is exactly like what it does. So we worry about something, hoping that by worrying, we'll stop it from happening. And Unfortunately, that's rarely the case. Yeah, because the issue becomes then that although fear is helpful, our bodies react to anxiety, trauma, and stress the same way as we do to fear and what we were discussing earlier to danger with that fear response. So we flood uh, with a chemical called cortisol and in small doses, it acts as that alarm. It's almost like an adrenaline spike that allows you to move. But when we're constantly anxious without the ability to address the fear because it's not in front of us, it keeps us trapped in that fight, flight, or freeze response, um, which is a part of our sympathetic nervous system, which we mentioned in our goals. So we're never able to switch off those danger signals. We feel like we can't do anything to handle it. And this can happen in the presence of social fears or even memories because your brain has difficulty distinguishing between what's in front of it and what it's thinking about. Um, and there's nowhere to run or flee. And so that's what happens when we feel like we're spiraling out of control. Um, what's interesting about it as well is that when you're in that sympathetic nervous system, it switches off the thinking part of your brain. Like again, you're not going to be thinking about moving away from the car which is why it becomes difficult to think clearly. Your mind might get fuzzy or hazy or you feel as though you're in a, th uh, a fog because your body isn't working in that state. It's attending to its vital functions. Um, and there are different ways that this can feel like too, which Hera is going to go over. Yep, so you may feel physical symptoms during stress, such as like dry mouth, sweating, fast breathing. Um, a racing heartbeat, um, feeling confused, feeling like that you're panicking, uh, feeling fear, uh, unhelpful thoughts or negative thinking like, um, you know, everybody hates me, um, I can't do this, or um, how I just can't deal with the situation. But it can also be intrusive thoughts. So like um, the fear that you'll lose control um, or that you might even die, it can feel that real. Um, and actions like we, actions that we can repeat like in a cycle, like things that are going on in your head again and again and again. Things like you know you want to run away, you want to avoid the fear altogether. Um, you may become aggressive, 
um, which is actually an attempt to regulate the difficult physical sensations that of fear that you're feeling. Um, and it's a strategy that we co- we use to cope in the present, but it can obviously hurt us later on. So mm. it's important to like recognize things that we do, which um, make sense in the moment, but then later on can be harmful to us and our relationships with the, our environment and the people around us. Mm-hmm. The short-term coping mechanism that long-term can come back to hurt us. Uh, the spiraling of symptoms is also what leads to panic attacks in the extreme form. So what happens is we notice these physical feelings or emotions and it's scary. So we begin to worry more. Uh, you can feel your heart tightening and then you focus in on your heart tightening. Uh, it becomes a fixation. And then our reactions worsen as we become more and more physically aware of what is going on. Absolutely. Um and I think that if you, if you are here with us today and you really want to know about how do you deal with this like anxiety and, and, and stress and panic attacks, um, you even just thinking about coming to the session may have led you to think like hyperventilate or you may have thought like, oh, do I really need to attend this? Is it really going to help me? Why is it so long? Or, you know, maybe it's not for me. All of these thoughts may have had the, like come to your head. Um, the one tip that we have for situations like this is as an immediate response is to try breathing into your hands so um, and then inhaling it. And the reason why this helps is because when we are panicking, we start breathing fast and that means we start inhaling uh, and, and taking in too much oxygen and it can be- become harder for us to think. Um, but we can try to balance this out by again, like taking in, taking your hands and then breathing into it and then inhaling. So if, if, it, if you are there um, and thinking about whether this can be helpful for you or not, why don't you try it right now uh, while we're talking to just get yourself in the habit of doing it. And it's also something that you can mask pretty easily if you're in public. So pretending to sneeze or just like pretending to smell this very nice flower that I have in my hand. No one needs to know there's no flower. <laughs> um, you know, the, there's something that you can do practically. Yeah, and the other bit of advice that we want to pass on that's important to remember when it comes to something as extreme as a panic attack is that your body can physically only take so much stress before it shuts down because cortisol is not a helpful chemical to have in your system for such a long period of time. It will shut off. Panic actually rises on a scale from 1 to 10. So if you're experiencing that gallop of thoughts and dread and negative emotion and you feel like there's nothing you can do you feel like you might die or you can't control it know that if you ever do hit a 10 your body will shut down and go back to normal so it knows how to fight to run how to stay still because it wants to protect you and you will stay well so you can use some of the grounding techniques to calm yourself down and attend to your anxiety but even if that doesn't work for you that day or you have to try it another day your body will still take care of you so again it will shut off because before you're too overwhelmed and if you take anything from the discussion today feel reassured and know that you are wired for that level of resilience um so going off of that when we talk about anxiety and how we actually can deal with it and manage our symptoms we are looking at techniques that soothe the sympathetic nervous system to switch off our fear response and move into really the, the calm nervous system. I think it's, it's easier to sort of remember it that way. So all of our techniques and tools are about teaching ourselves to step back and remember when, how, and where we are actually safe or clear our minds. So Hera, do you want to tell us about that first technique? Yeah, so we, you've actually already done it, which is the grounding exercise. Um, and grounding exercises are uh, very popular and uh, there's a good reason for that because they are simple ways of us utilizing all of our senses or some of our senses in um, helping us take away from the storm that may be in our head and to bring us down, really literally ground us in, in the current moment that we are. Um, it can really help if you're feeling dissociated, like, you know, sometimes you feel like things are happening to someone else, Mm -hmm. but they're happening to you. 
or that you feel like you're watching things happen to you and it's a very strange experience it happened during a panic attack as well so like how do you stop your mind from drifting into that that, that way of thinking so you can use these techniques and they're really simple and then sometimes they sound so simple and you think how can this possibly you know <laughs> surmount this like storm of emotion that i'm going through but they can um and they can be really really like immediate steps that you can do uh, that can help so we i'm going to give you some examples um and then becky can actually write them out for you as well so you can uh, take them uh, with you for later so um just remember that they connect you back to your body and the present moment as soon as you start feeling out of control you can use them so examples could be you could take a walk uh look outside the window and count the number of trees or cars that you can see or if you live where there's a, a building of flats or houses in front of you count the houses count the windows so count and take your mind off you know what you're thinking you can also find an object near you i'll do this so i have a hair clip so find an object near you and it, you know describe it to yourself feel feel it so my clip is cool to the touch it's plastic and um i know if i do this it makes a sound so again it's like using our senses and and, and trying to feel like where we are and what's around us another example is thinking of a word that makes you calm another variation of this is is to actually write that word on your palm and that way you're using a tactile sense and the last one is to use your voice when we're thinking in our head we're listening to a different kind of voice that's inside our head and that can be very negative and again you can feel miles away from where you are and what's happening around you by actually using your voice even if it's just calling out to your pet calling out to yourself saying something affirming out loud you can you know bring yourself back to where you should be so um these are ideas and there if you google you'll find lots of grounding exercises online which you can use and if you join our courses we'll give you we'll go through a different one every single time you see a video which is really helpful because then you get used to doing them mm -hmm. so again these grounding techniques are really like relaxation techniques they have the opposite effect on the body as the fear response so instead of uncomfortable physical sensations, sweating, the racing heart, we lower our heart rates by listening, by going through activities that we could only do in rest. And our body almost catches up with that thought and says, actually, you know what? No, I am safe. Or you work with your body and you show your mind, if my body can do this, then I'm safe. Almost in that communication back and forth between the two. And so when we make our bodies relax, those danger signs in the sympathetic nervous system have to switch off. So what's important to remember is only one nervous system can be on or like on at any one time. So if we sit down and let's say we go through a breathing exercise, our parasympathetic nervous system starts up instead and that shuts down the rapid heart rate, the tension, the stress. So, you know, many of us have already found ways of um, regulating our nervous systems in the past. So some of you are going through them right now. So, for example, listing, um, like counting and listing type of grounding exercises. Mm -hmm. uh, Becky said the one about like listing dog breeds, <laughs> which, uh, which is a good one. And um, so these are all ways of bringing down the press in the system. Um, and they're often called coping mechanisms. So you may have heard that before. Um, there are coping mechanisms that are um, better for you and those that aren't. So, for example, depending on who you are and, and what your situation is, it could be eating, drinking, or even self-harm. And um, these are ways of returning to our physical self and rest state. Um, and mm -hmm. in this way, you know, we've already been used to tr trying to take care of ourselves because that's our instinct we just haven't known that that's what we were trying to do and it's only when you look back and reflect and you think like why was it that i was doing that um and sometimes we don't have that uh you know that privilege of having that introspection about what's good for you um in the long term so you've probably practiced some healthy uh, relaxation techniques we've already done a few with you um there might be other things that you like doing like uh, singing taking um a bubble bath 
taking a walk. Um, and again, these are all things that we do to bring our parasympathetic system, or as <laughs> Alison coined it, our calm ner nervous system. My husband would be shocked that you tried to rename <laughs> a legitimate <I'm> so <laughs> <laughs> medical <laughs> term. <laughs> no, he will not be watching this video. Um, <laughs> but in this way, self-care and our, our these are ways of us attending to ourselves um, and attending to our needs by doing things um, that we love and things that um, can often feel like we're being self-indulgent, uh, but our radical acts of kindness to ourselves. Um, and they're necessary to, for us to balance our systems and have our bodies and minds be in a place that they should be, which is feeling happy, calm, feeling respected. So we've got some ideas uh, for you about effective and healthy coping mechanisms that you can do at home um, and they can help lessen the impact of these triggers for you. So we've discussed grounding exercise already. And then there's some other stress management techniques that you can use, which means that you analyzing what it is that is causing stress to you and then trying to figure out that you know is this stress factor necessary for you in your life and where you are and where you want to go and how is it that you can limit it with boundaries or take it out if it's being a toxic element in your life um, and then third are breathing exercises so if any of you are a fan of yoga you will would have done tons of breathing exercises but if you're not uh, or meditation but if not, give it a try because these are different ways of, again, doing breathing exercises. And actually, breathing exercises are one of those areas where people have been super creative and come up with like very interesting ways of doing breathing exercises with different music, with different colors and lots of different things. So you can find you can even find um, breathing videos to follow along to on YouTube, not with a person, but small little graphs that move in and out and follow along. And um, I think my favorite bit about breathing exercises, too, is that they've actually been documented to decrease your reaction to stress long term. So every single time you practice, even just doing five breaths, um, let's say like deep breaths just to yourself before going to sleep or when you're beginning to feel stressed, it gets easier and easier and easier to settle your anxiety and get back to feeling well. So overall, by relaxing the body in these various ways, Hopefully you can let go of anxious thoughts and feelings. And also, as Hera said too, it's important to make sense of what triggered us and think about why and the boundaries that you can put in place or comforting yourself and knowing that you can use these techniques to cut them off. Because we are always able to switch off these signals when we attend to the body, when our minds feel like they're getting away from us. And we're never helpless. I think one thing that's so difficult with anxiety is, again, because we're not thinking clearly, we feel out of control. And it's really, we just want to emphasize that you do have control over yourself, even when everything might make you think otherwise. Um, and then another way that we can also reduce anxiety is to improve our predictions. So we spoke about how in fear you're reacting to an immediate danger signal, Whereas with anxiety, you're trying to figure out what's going to happen in the future. So you're thinking of option A, B, C, D, E, F, G all at the same time. So because anxiety stems from that unknown, when we write down, let's say, what's all the possible outcomes, what's going on in my head, what's the worst thing that could happen? And is it really that bad? How can I prepare from that and prevent it from happening? It helps us focus our actions the way that we would in reaction to an immediate danger and take control in advance rather than feeling as though everything is uncertain. And this is why boundaries are so important and can be radical um, because I think we have been uh, in many communities and many uh, cultures, we have been told not to have those boundaries and then teaching ourselves to create and enforce those boundaries can help us ensure our mental and physical uh, well-being. So we have a whole course on this coming up because even us as a team found it hard mm -hmm. to create the content for that course. So we're working with a therapist to help us create that because we think us as a team need, need that in our lives. Yeah, so, even just defining boundaries was difficult. Very difficult. So uh, we're going to move on to... Um, ants as coined by becky which are automatic negative thoughts 
So mm -hmm. Alison, tell us what ants are and why should we care about them? So for those of us with anxiety, we are talking about ants, automatic negative thoughts, because they're basically the very first thing that we think about when we have any anxious thought or feeling in our body. It's that sort of default negative idea that intrudes. <laughs> so as we're talking through anxious thoughts on repeat, we're really looking at self-esteem when it comes to anxiety and how certain we feel attending to threats or issues in our life and our environment. So it's so easy to suffer from that generalized negative thinking, whether it's in a situation in ourselves or in others. And again, just like the anxious thought, there's a reason for it. Uh, if bad things have happened to us over a short period of time, or we receive negative messages from people, we might have a crisis of confidence and our self image naturally can deteriorate. Um, as humans, we're also just more likely to ingest and believe the bad things that we hear, especially about ourselves. It's again, just the way that we're wired to focus on that one bad thing, supposedly that we can fix or deal with. And it's not your fault, but it can have a huge impact on our stress and on our personal well-being. Unfortunately, when we start thinking negatively about ourselves, it could just spiral into more negative thinking and snowballs and we start to reinforce like all the things that we you know have doubts over uh, about ourselves it could, you know it could be our low self esteem it could be our anxiety um any other um negative uh, thinking about bringing ourselves down it it starts piling up and you know over time this can be so automatic that you, you even it becomes second nature you just don't even notice um, you just switch to that negative thinking and it'll cause you to question yourself. It'll change your behavior. You might cancel on plans. You may be less ambitious for yourself. You may be less good in setting and enforcing those boundaries. Um, and it can, you know, create a negative, like a wire of negativity around you um, and not just bring yourself down, but also affect your relationship with others um, and therefore creating more and more anxiety for you. So um, these symptoms can, you know, feed into one another and can become a vicious cycle. And so some of the helpful things that we like to remember um, when it comes to our group calls is ants, like the bugs, can be identified and then challenged when they pop up. So we wanted to give you a list of what those thoughts look like. So the next time maybe you default to a negative thought about a situation, event, or about yourself, you'll be able to note what it is and decide whether or not that could actually be true. Um, maybe you should interrogate it more, think about it. I've heard um, the automatic negative thoughts also be described almost like snow tracks you make in the snow that you can follow by default. And we're trying to notice them in the mark that they've made and create a new path. So ants are often distorted. They don't fit, fit the facts of the situation. They're always unhelpful. They keep your self-esteem low. They make it difficult to change or feel empowered or even take action. Uh, they're automatic. So again, they pop up without effort. They're the first bad thing that you think. They're involuntary. So they're hard to switch off. And they're not based on evidence, but they feel plausible. So it doesn't occur to us to question them. And they're also predictive. So what we were talking about with anxiety, again, where you're trying to think of every possible event that could happen, these thoughts tend to reflect the worst case scenario without knowing why or if it will even occur. And with enough practice in questioning these negative thoughts, you, we can begin to challenge our thinking and it can become more fair and balanced, um, you know, and represent the reality more. Um, so how can we begin to do this? Um, you know, how do we identify, challenge and chain negative thinking and attend to our anxiety? Thought diaries. <laughs> so again, it sounds simple. Uh, what? Keeping a diary can help me with this? <laughs> Alison, tell us, how can it help you? So in Bloom, we found that you need to take your thoughts and put them <laughs> in another place to be able to analyze them. It forces our thoughts out of our head and onto paper. 
So where they can be considered in a less personal way, we can make sense of the patterns, um, what causes us stress. And we can also begin to consider those alternative, let's say rational responses and decide that we believe them because they're the ones that have evidence. They're the ones that can be backed up that don't reflect that list that we talked about in distorted thinking. So we want to encourage you the next time you feel anxious and automatically begin 